Hello, and welcome back to the Sino Babble podcast. I have two quick announcements before we start today's episode. First, don't forget that you can subscribe to updates on the Sino Babble website, where you'll receive an email notifying you every time a new episode is released, along with an interesting article or fact about China. All you have to do is go to sinobabble.com, click on the contact button, fill in the subscribe box with your name and email, and then wait to hear from me. The second announcement is that a few people have emailed me separately asking where they can donate to support the podcast. The podcast is still really, really small, and I had no idea of monetizing it in general. So I think it's really sweet that people want to donate, and I'm very, very grateful that you guys have reached out to ask. So in light of this, I've set up a little PayPal donate button on the Sinobabble website, which is on the menu bar at the bottom on desktop and at the top on mobile. So if you'd like, you can give a one-off donation, or you can set up a monthly subscription for as much or as little as you want. Anything that you give will be greatly appreciated. And if you don't want to give anything at all, that is fine. Like I said, I wasn't expecting anything. So, okay, those are the announcements. Let's get into today's episode. This is the second episode of three that I'll be doing on the CCP's incorporation of the periphery into the PRC after 1949. The last episode was all about Tibet, and this week we're talking about Mongolia. Once again, I'll be talking a lot about the historical relationship between the Mongolian people and the mainland Han Chinese people, to give context to why modern China feels that Inner Mongolia deserves to be part of the great Chinese nation. As with Tibet, we're going to start with a brief history of Mongolia from the Middle Ages, more because it's interesting than because it's directly relevant to the rest of the plot, but it does become relevant when we get to around the middle of the 17th century. Basically, I just wanted to talk about the Mongolian Yuan dynasty in China because I think it's cool, But there is some relation to the rest of the story, so just bear with me, sit back, relax, we're going to talk about Genghis Khan, it's going to be fun. The Mongolians make up one of many groups of nomadic herdsmen who live throughout the sparsely populated Inner Asian region, known as the Steppe. Ever since the Chinese began keeping records, they have maps and writings about peoples such as the Jurchens in the northeast, the Kitans in the north, and Uyghurs in the west who traded and raided the settled agricultural populous Chinese people who thrived in the milder climes of China proper. It's worth remembering here that the Great Wall of China was built by the first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi, during the Qin Dynasty, or at least he started to build it during that time, and the reason for its construction was to keep out all of those pesky nomadic barbarians who kept stealing from the local Chinese farmers when the trade deals went wrong and they felt that they weren't getting a good deal. But in general, there was some relationship between the settled Han Chinese people and the nomadic people, and the two groups traded with each other very frequently. These inner Asian nomadic communities were usually made up of clans, which were lineage-based groups, who would then team up with other clans to make tribes, and then on occasion, these tribes would be united under one very good military leader to make an army that would then go around pillaging and, if they could be bothered, conquering other tribes and settled peoples. One of the most famous of these very good military leaders, who was able to unite all the tribes together and go and conquer everyone else, was a man called Genghis Khan. Original name Temujin, sometimes known as Chinggis, hereafter referred to as Genghis, was born around 1162 and rose to fame after avenging the death of his father, a good start to any action-adventure plot. By 1206, he had united all the tribes in the surrounding area, bringing men from Mongol, Tatar, Turkic and other ethnic groups into his military before setting off to create the largest contiguous empire in history. By the time he died in 1227, he had conquered most of Eurasia up to the Caspian Sea in Europe and all of Central and Northern Asia, including the Korean Peninsula. He became so successful essentially because he ignored the basic tenets of nomadic rule by bringing other tribes, races and ethnicities into the military and ruling classes, adopting a written language based on the Uyghur script, and creating settlements for the Mongolians in conquered states. Genghis was pragmatic and ruthless at the same time, allowing those who surrendered into the army no problem, but slaughtering entire cities if their leader decided to put up a fight and then lost, which they inevitably did. 
Now, to avoid this becoming a history lesson on the Mongolian Empire, I'm going to skip to the end here. Genghis famously had many successors, and after he died, his Khanate, or Empire, was split up between four of his sons. But the one we care about now is his third son, Ogadai, because he inherited Mongolia, and then started eyeing up China for invasion immediately. So, a quick primer on China during the 12th and 13th centuries. China wasn't completely unified at the point when the Mongolians invaded and took over. The previous Song dynasty had ruled over the entire of China from 960 to 1127, at which point the Jurchens, who were from Manchuria, invaded, establishing the Jin dynasty based in Beijing, and pushing the Song court south of the Yangtze to Hangzhou. So, when Ogadai invaded in 1234, he actually invaded the Jin Empire in northern China and took control of that area. By the time he died in 1241, he had invaded the entire northern part of China, Tibet and Sichuan, but had not invaded China proper. The Song dynasty continued until 1279 and were actually invaded by Ogadai's nephew, Kublai Khan, in 1268, when he named himself the Emperor of the Yuan dynasty, and by 1279 he had defeated the Song entirely and conquered the whole of China. Random interesting fact about this, so the Mongolians didn't have ships, they had never done naval warfare before because they were horsemen, so because the Mongols had gone around incorporating all of these different ethnic groups into their army, when it came time to cross the Yangtze River, they actually used engineers from the Middle East and Iran to help them build ships and bridges to help them cross. And that's how they managed to conquer the part of China that no foreign conquerors had ever been able to reach before. So I thought that was quite interesting. So anyway, from 1279 to 1368, we have the Yuan Mongol dynasty in China. During the Yuan, the Mongolians were able to keep ethnic distinction between themselves and the Chinese, despite their willingness to allow other ethnic groups into the ruling elite and military leadership. The Chinese who lived under the Song dynasty were actually the lowest ranking of all the peoples in the Yuan dynasty, and were forbidden from intermarriage with the Mongols, taking Mongolian names and carrying weapons, subject to harsher punishments if they committed a crime, and barred from high status positions. Now, Chinese culture is generally impenetrable, and so Chinese customs were preserved during this period. The people were not Mongolified in any way, but at the same time, the Mongols worked to prevent themselves from becoming Sinified, fearful that their culture would be overrun by the much more numerous Chinese. For example, even though the Mongolians practiced Tibetan Buddhism, the Chinese did not become more Buddhist during this period and Confucianism remained the dominant culture and religious force among the common people and the Han Chinese literati class. In 1368, an ethnic Chinese dynasty, led by the peasant Zhu Yuanzhang, pushed the Mongols back into Mongolia, establishing the Ming dynasty in China, which lasted until 1644. During that period, the Mongols had retreated back to Mongolia to continue what they called the Northern Yuan dynasty, which switched hands between the Genghisid clan, which means the descendants of Genghis Khan, and other powerful competed tribal groups for about 300 years. So fast forward to 1644, and the end of the last ethnically Chinese dynasty, the Ming dynasty. Once the Ming dynasty in China is pushed out by the Qing dynasty, which is made up of united Manchu tribes, they also took over Mongolia, which was ironic because it was originally the Mongolian Yuan dynasty who had defeated the Manchu Jin dynasty in 1234, and now the current Qing dynasty, who were the descendants of that Manchu dynasty, were now taking over the Mongolians. But yeah, anyway. The Qing dynasty expanded the Chinese Empire's territory to its largest size, and were responsible for the division of Mongolia into its inner and outer regions. So now we come to the all-important question. Why was Mongolia divided into two separate administrative regions known as Inner and Outer Mongolia? It basically comes down to a question of timing and the willingness of certain parts of Mongolia to submit to Qing rule. Before the Manchus established their dynasty in China in 1644, they first worked to get several Mongolian tribes on side and integrate them into their military, 
These tribes were mainly in the southern part of Mongolia, now known as Inner Mongolia, and their incorporation was not the result of a simple military takeover, but involved diplomacy and political manoeuvring throughout the early 1600s. In the 1620s, for example, a Mongolian tribesman named Ligdan Khan launched a series of raids in order to try and establish a unified Mongol Khanate in southern Mongolia. In order to stop his expansion and also to stem the flow of Mongolian refugees into Manchu territory, the Manchus, led by Nurhachi and then his son Hong Taiji, fought Ligdan alongside various other Mongol leaders, creating strong diplomatic ties with these tribes that later turned into tributary states as the power of the Manchus expanded. Ligdan eventually died in 1634, and the Mongols who had joined the Manchu army were organised under a separate eight-banner system, similar to that which the Qing dynasty used to organise its own armies. A new governing body was created, called the Li Fanyuan, or Board for Governing Outer Territories, and that was basically put in charge of administering Inner Mongolia. These Inner Mongolian tribes were smaller units and had also previously been loyal to the Ming court, and thus they were easier to pacify by the Qing Manchus. They also strengthened ties between the two groups by allowing intermarriage between the Qing and Mongolian aristocracy, and by granting most of the groups who remained loyal some autonomy and other privileges, creating a system of indirect rule that carried on till the end of the Qing dynasty. Local ruling lords were appointed by the Qing emperor and were usually from the Chinggisid group, or like I said, descendants of Genghis Khan, as they were recognised by Mongolians across the board as being legitimate rulers. The co-optation of Outer Mongolia into the Qing empire took a little longer to achieve, and was actually completed after the Qing had asserted its rule in mainland China. The Mongols in Outer Mongolia were divided into two main groups, the Oirats in the west, also known as the Zungar, and the Khalkha in the east. These two groups did not want to submit to the Qing, but they also had a long-standing rivalry with each other, as well as lots of internal disputes, which came to a head in the second half of the 17th century. In 1678, a man named Galdan rose to power as Khan of the Western Zungar Mongols. He derived his legitimacy not from being a descendant of Genghis Khan, but from his recognition from the Dalai Lama as Tibetan Buddhism had been established as the main religion of the Mongolians not long before. Galdan had actually been a disciple of the Dalai Lama, but returned to avenge the murder of his brother and ended up uniting all of the Oirat Mongols in the west. Meanwhile, the Khalkha Mongols in the east were divided into four feuding factions, who were also caught up in internal fighting throughout the 1660s and 1670s. In 1686, when someone from the Khalkhan side did something to offend Galdan from the Oirat side, the two sides then started fighting each other. The Kangxi Emperor of China decided to intervene due to the disruption that this fighting caused on the borders of the empire. The expeditions against Gao Dan were long and onerous, and the Qing army suffered heavy losses, but they did manage to get the Khalkhan ruler to submit to the Qing Emperor in 1691. However, the Dzungar Mongols in the west still refused to submit, even after the death of Gao Dan in 1697. In 1715, the Qing and Dzungas finally faced off, using a disagreement over the appointment of the 6th Dalai Lama, in which the Dzungas actually killed the de facto leader that the Qing had installed in Tibet, as an excuse to wage full-scale war. The Qing managed to regain control by 1724, bringing both Outer Mongolia and Tibet securely under their control. So, I say all of this to say that the Outer Mongolians were distinct from the Inner Mongolians for a long period of time, not just due to Han Chinese administration, but also because of the tribal and some religious differences. Outer Mongolia was eventually brought under the same administrative framework as Inner Mongolia, but it kept a more distinct identity due to the more homogenous Khalkha population, who today are known as the Hal, and the centralised Buddhist religious system in the region based on Tibetan Buddhism. Inner and Outer Mongolia were also kept as administratively separate units under the Qing, with the inner portion being governed more directly. The Inner Mongolian noblemen were also much more entwined with the Qing court, which is important and it comes up later when we talk about Mongolian independence. <laughs> 
Things sort of continued in this vein until the late Qing, when problems such as the Opium Wars and the Taiping Rebellion forced the Qing to allow Han migration into Inner Mongolia, which had previously been banned. After the failure of the Boxer Rebellion to expel Westerners from China at the turn of the 20th century, the Qing launched a new programme to reclaim agricultural land in Mongolia for settlement by Han Chinese farmers so that they could raise money to pay for the Boxer indemnity to Western powers. This opening up of land caused a huge influx of migration of Han Chinese to the area. By the end of the Qing dynasty, there were approximately 1.5 million Han Chinese in Mongolia, compared with around 878,000 Mongolians. Following the fall of the Qing dynasty in 1911, the outer Mongolian noblemen and religious leaders declared independence, expelling the Manchu and Han Chinese officials and soldiers, and founding the Mongolian People's Republic. Many inner Mongolian nobles wanted to join them, but they were divided amongst themselves, as many had also had strong ties to the Qing dynasty, either through marriage or through position, as mentioned earlier. And many still cooperated with the now deposed Qing leaders in hopes that they would be restored to power. Because of their dilly dallying, the very weak and incompetent Chinese Republican government took the opportunity in 1914 to create three separate provinces in Inner Mongolia called Suiyan, Chaha, and Rehe. Arguably, it was this move that spurred on Mongolian nationalism, as in 1925, an Inner Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party was founded and began demanding independence from their Chinese colonisers. They were also supported by the Japanese invaders throughout the 1930s, when the formation of Manchukuo in Manchuria meant that the Mongolians finally had some buffer against the Chinese. In an attempt to put a stop to this resistance movement, the three inner Mongolian provinces were dissolved by Chiang Kai-shek in 1928 and simply merged into pre-existing Chinese provinces erasing Inner Mongolia from the map altogether. It wasn't just the map of Mongolia that was disappearing either. The number of Mongolians in Inner Mongolia was dwindling due to warfare and widespread disease. By 1937, there were only around 864,000 Mongolians, compared with over 3 million Han Chinese. Despite their small numbers and against the odds, autonomous movements began springing up all across the region. One was led by a Mongolian prince named Demchug Dongrob, and that's the only time I'm going to say his name, in the central part of Inner Mongolia, who relied heavily on Japanese support and ultimately ended up losing legitimacy when the Japanese were defeated in 1945. There was another group called the Tumed, who were actually communists and ended up allying with the CCP in the 1930s. When the CCP fled north during the Long March, and Mao was still claiming that self-determination would prevail in the border regions if the CCP won, the Tumed happily joined the communist cause, fighting the nationalists, moving to the CCP base in Yan'an, and their leader, Ulan Hu, actually joined the CCP Central Committee in 1945, the highest rank achieved by any ethnic minority in the Chinese communist movement. Ulan Hu ends up being quite an important figure for Mongolian politics, so you might want to remember his name, as he might come up in future episodes. In eastern Inner Mongolia, a final group emerged made up of fragmented tribes. They tried first to get incorporated into the Mongolian Republic in Outer Mongolia, but they failed, and so instead they set up the Eastern Mongolian Autonomous Government in 1946. However, when the nationalists took over Manchuria towards the end of the civil war, the CCP stepped in to stop the new autonomous government from being overrun, sending Ulanhu to help the eastern government establish the Inner Mongolian Autonomous Government in 1947. Once the nationalists were defeated and the PRC was established, the new autonomous government expanded slowly to pick up all of the other areas of Inner Mongolia that had been absorbed into other provinces over the years, creating the map of Inner Mongolia as we know it today. As part of their newfound autonomy, the Mongolian government had to agree to let the Han populations that settled in these areas stay, creating unforeseen future problems when it came to the continuation of Mongolian culture and language. As for Outer Mongolia, which is now the Mongolian People's Republic, they were promised independence by Chiang Kai-shek back in the 1940s. But Chiang actually made this promise not to the Mongolians, 
but to the Russians and to Stalin, who demanded this in return for not supporting the CCP, which he then went on to do anyway. When the CCP ascended to power, Mao tried to persuade Stalin to hand over Outer Mongolia, but he was rebuffed, as he was in many other things. Further attempts to persuade the USSR after the death of Stalin were also in vain, as by then, they argued, the Mongolian people were free to decide their own fate. So, you may have noticed that there's quite a difference between how Inner Mongolia was assimilated into the PRC versus how Tibet was assimilated. The Mongolian situation was quite boring, for want of a better word, and there was very little conflict or strife even in the early 20th century and the years following 1949. Though there were some protest movements, particularly during the Cultural Revolution, which we'll get to in a later episode, Since 1981, there have been no large-scale movements demanding independence for Inner Mongolia, in stark contrast to the situations in Tibet and Xinjiang. However, much like their counterparts in Tibet and Xinjiang, the Mongolians face a lot of pressure to assimilate to the majority Han culture and language. This is coupled with the fact that their physical presence in the region has also long since dwindled. As of the year 2000, A census reveals that the Inner Mongolian Autonomous Region has a population of 23.3 million, 79.2% of whom were Han Chinese, and only 17.1% of whom were Mongolian. Essentially, the colonisation of Inner Mongolia by the CCP was a slow and steady death by numbers, which is both anticlimactic and a little bit sad. We'll talk about the implications of this sort of migration policy in the last episode of this topic, as well as throughout the series when we return to the question of minority integration and so-called Han chauvinism. What is clear from the case of Inner Mongolia is that the power of Chinese culture is strong, particularly as the Han Chinese tend to have a vast numerical advantage over whoever enters their domain, leading to a battle between the minority group's ethnic consciousness and their national Chinese identity. Parts of the traditional Mongolian way of life are being eroded, ostensibly because of economic and environmental concerns, but ultimately leading to an erasure of their heritage. Grazing and pastoralism, for example, are discouraged as the government links these practices to desertification in the region and instead promotes settled agricultural practices and the resettling of previously nomadic families in urban areas. Many of the older herdsmen in the Mongolian communities recognise that their traditional way of life is slowly coming to an end. In one article I read, in an interview, an older herdsman expressed that all of his children had moved to the urban areas to get jobs, and were unlikely to return as they saw this way of life as boring. Others complained still that the government restricted grazing for environmental reasons, but still allowed mining companies to operate and even expand. Now that the majority of Mongolians are either settled farmers or urbanites, many young people can neither speak nor read Mongolian despite the seemingly bilingual nature of the province. Speaking Mandarin offers better job prospects, as many university courses and government jobs cater only to Mandarin speakers, and for those who want to work outside of the province and move to other parts of China, command of Mandarin is even more necessary. It seems that the question is no longer will there be cultural assimilation of the Mongolian people, but rather when will this assimilation be completed? The Mongolian people are too few and too dispersed to effectively resist Chinese dominance, and the historic ties to the mainland are arguably stronger to those of Outer Mongolia, especially in the last 300 years or so. Though some older Mongolians are resentful of the change, and others still cling to the idea of reunification with the Mongolian Republic, it's not as if Mongolia is entirely free of Chinese influence either. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Mongolian Republic was left dependent on China for economic support, and since 1999, China has been Mongolia's largest trading partner. It also provides loans and investment to the country for the development of its infrastructure, the majority of which originates from the Inner Mongolian province. Thus, even if Inner Mongolia wanted to seek closer ties with their old tribesmen, they would realistically be best placed to do it through cooperation with the Chinese government. There's no doubt that as China continues to dominate the region politically and economically, and the numbers of ethnic Mongolians continue to diminish, it's in the economic best interests of the next generation of Inner Mongolians to continue to assimilate if they want to prosper, 
even if it isn't in the best interests of their heritage and ancestral homeland. So that's it for this episode, guys. Before I wrap this episode up, I thought I would just talk really quickly about some interesting things that I've been reading in the Chinese news recently. Well, it's not really news, but for some reason, there have been lots of articles recently about sex education and sexual awareness in China. Now, for those of you who don't know or couldn't guess, the attitudes towards sex in China are still quite traditional and a little bit archaic. There have been a few really good articles I've read. One was about a woman who was holding sort of s and classes. It was more like a foreplay class, but there were pictures of whips and things like that. It was very interesting to read some of the discussions from people who had never experienced an orgasm, mainly women, of course, or didn't even know if they could enjoy sex at all. Some people had never experienced anything like foreplay before. And it was a very eye-opening read. The woman running the class actually calls herself a sex therapist, which I think is a great title. Um, If you want to read that article, it's on a website called Sixth Tone, and the title is The Sex Therapist Busting China's Bedroom Taboos. Now, like I said, I've been coming across lots of articles about sex in China, and one I wanted to share with you is another one that was also on Sixth Tone. It's called National Survey Lays Bare the Sex Lives of Chinese Students. And it's basically a huge survey about Chinese university students' attitudes towards sex. It's very eye-opening, and I just wanted to share some of the stats with you, just in case you were interested. So there shows some break with the conformist traditional attitudes towards marriage. For example, 73% of students said that they would only marry the right one, as opposed to someone who their parents wanted them to marry, which is also a reflection of the declining marriage rate in the country. Now, on sex education, only half of the surveyed students said that they received sex education in school, and less than 15% said that they felt satisfied with what they were taught. That's quite interesting. I believe in the UK that sex education is compulsory. I remember receiving it before I went to secondary school, actually, and then having that reinforced again when we went to secondary school. Also, our biology lessons were quite explicit, so it's quite interesting to see different attitudes in different countries. There's a huge gender divide in attitudes towards sex as well. So, for example, 83% of male students said that they would have sex in a hotel room or live with their partner before they were married, compared with only 60% of women. And only 55% of female students said that they would have sex before marriage, while 75% of men said that they were okay with it. Just over 31% of university students said that they had had penetrative sex before. And less than 20% said that they were sexually active every week. Now, this was the bit that really interested me. Over 56% of female students said that they had never masturbated, compared with 13% of men. More than 30% of women said that they had never experienced an orgasm or didn't know what one was. The majority of women also opposed things like one-night stands and just like casual sex or casual dating as well. So I find all of this very interesting. Obviously, there's still a big cultural divide between China and Western countries, but I thought that was a really interesting way to shed light on the situation. I guess there's a difference between, you know, not having sex before marriage and not knowing what an orgasm is. So it's not just a sort of cultural or traditional thing. It also sheds a light on the state of the Chinese education system and what they really put an emphasis on. There was another article that kind of tied in that spoke about how lots of students from rural areas, because they'd worked so hard in school to get into these elite universities, just didn't know how to socialise and had no friends. So I think this whole thing is really tied in in one big ball. Students who go to these elite universities, they don't really know how to socialise with each other. And instead, they just study all the time. You know, some of them do party, but the idea of sex or like sexual pleasure, especially considering that most of them have to live in dorm rooms with about five or six other people, it's often the furthest thing from their mind. So I thought that was quite interesting. It's very different mindset and sort of set of experiences from when I went to university and I guess how Western students experience sexuality. So yeah, I thought that was just something interesting to share with you guys. You can read the full articles on the website Sixth Tone. To reiterate some earlier announcements, and just to add one new one, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast newsletter on the Sinobabble website if you want to be notified when a new episode comes out. 
what it's about, plus an extra article about China with some possible commentary. Don't forget to rate the podcast on whatever app you're listening to it on, because that also helps and it's a nice thing to do. And if you would like to make either a one-off or monthly donation to the podcast, you can do so by going to sinobabble.com and clicking on the donate button. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you tune in next time.